Let's talk just about the delay here, the time of the delay. Um, so they started building in 536. According to Ezra 4.5, it's they there was a delay from the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, until the reign of Darius, and we just read that same thing. So we talked about the decree by Cyrus, and Cyrus reigned for seven years. So for five years of his reign, they were not building because they started in the second year of his reign, and then they were forced to stop. So for five years of his reign, they didn't build, right? And then Cambyses, which was his son, Cyrus' son, he reigned for seven and a half years. So now we're up to 12 and a half years when they're doing nothing. They're stopped because of this, these adversaries. And then this fella, Pseudo Smyrtus, reigned for just seven months. So now we're up to about 13 years, right, that they're stopping. And then Darius, in the first year of his reign, is when they started again. So we're in a delay of about 14 years when they just stopped. So just wanted to remind you of the time frame here. It's easy to read these things on a page and not make sense for the amount of a man or woman's mind is really all we're talking about when they started 14 years later before they started again. So think about some of the things that you have been through and, and Eddie kind of got the chronology thing too. If you draw the chronology, you can see some of these dates on here. If you don't have one, you have a big one. The amount of time that these things are really talking about, it's just not black and white words on a page. These are years of people's lives that we're talking about here. So for 13 or 14 years. So if you look at that, the, the amount of time, the time period we're talking about over here on this side in, in 722 is when the northern 10 tribes were carried away by Assyria. And down here in 605, is when the southern two tribes were carried away by Babylon. That captivity, the Babylonian captivity, is the captivity that Jeremiah chapter 29 talks about. And when we cite the verse in Jeremiah 20, 11, everybody cites that verse that says, For I know the thoughts that I think for you, said the Lord, about the peace and how the evil to give you peace and hope. That is talking about 70 years of captivity. That captivity that started in 605 and ended in about 538 when Cyrus said, okay, you guys go back and you build the temple. Anybody that wants to go, you build. That was the end of the So that 70 years, Jeremiah 29 is talking about. <clears throat> now, to get kind of a broad outline, though, well, let me introduce you to what we're going to talk about now by saying that as you read the history, so I'll get to it a little bit there. What You see this disobedience obedience thing, and it's all through the Old Testament. The thing that I started to think about with this, though, was what happened to Abraham. Are we okay? Are we okay? Okay. Okay. I'm not sure I like the tone of that remark. Is that okay? I'm sorry. The thing that I started, uh, that started me thinking about this obedience, disobedience thing was Matthew 23, 37 that Pastor D.A. shared Sunday morning. So, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, 
you that kill the prophets, stone those that said to you, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathers her chickens out of her wings, and you would not. Now, if you think about that verse, just think about that verse, what does that say about God's desire for a relationship with Jeru Jerusalem? Jerusalem standing for Israel, you know, the, the believers that live there. What does that say about God's desire for that relationship? It's there. It's repetitive, right? How many times have I done this? I sent messengers to you. You killed them. You stoned them. How many times would I have done this? And then the last part of the verse. What was the controlling factor? Who controlled whether that relationship was going to go anywhere or not? They did. That's exactly right. They did. And that's true for us as well. And you see that with Israel all through the Old Testament. It was not God's desire that all this stuff happened. God's desire was to bless their socks off. When you read some of what Moses said, it was just ridiculous. I mean, they were going to be the talk of the world. That was what this was supposed to be. But they would not. They wouldn't do it. They were the controlling factor, just like this verse indicates. God wanted to do this again and again and again. And this is spoken by Messiah after they rejected him. So the controlling factor here was the Israelites. They were the ones that stopped this relationship from happening, from this relationship from growing. Okay? And that's what got me thinking about the obedience, disobedience, because you see this pattern all through the Old Testament, all through the Old Testament. So we're going to get a really running start here, so stick with me um, on some dates, all right? So the Exodus happens in 1450. Don't need to, we can, we can round the dates, all right? 1450. They go into the Promised Land, remember, 40 years later, 1406, okay? So 40 years later, they're going in there. Now we're going to read some of what Moses says about this, but you see this first obedience, disobedience thing in Numbers chapter 14, please turn there. Numbers chapter 14. After the Exodus, this is the first time you see sort of the character of the children of Israel and then the consequence that happens because of what they do. Numbers chapter 14. And we'll read. Now, we're going to be doing a little reading tonight, so I apologize for that, but there's no other way to get familiar with these records than to read them. Okay? And again, I, of course, encourage you to read these records. Um, would someone like to read Numbers 14, 1 through 24. Go. Loudly, please. Whoop. Oh, I'm sorry. Loudly, if you're going to do it. Loudly. You might want to stand up. And so all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried. And the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if only we had died in the land of Egypt, or if only we had died in this wilderness, why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become victims? Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us select the leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces. Before all the children of the congregation of the children of Israel. For Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. 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 Okay. Who were among those who inspired out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through is spied out to an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. The land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor appear to be the land. 
Okay, Bruce, we're not going to read quite as much. If you would skip to verse 21, uh, I'm sorry, 22, read verses 22 through 24. Because all these things to have seen my glory in the signs of which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness, and I put into the festival these Gentiles and have not heeded my voice. They certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see. One more, 24. Uh, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in his heart, and he has called me to me, I will go into the land where he goes. And here's the thing that shall be said. Thank you. So we see there the first instance of this disobedience, right? And the consequence of it. A whole generation dies, a whole generation doesn't inherit the land. There's an effect on the other generation, the next generation, but we won't talk anything about that. But this is the first instance of disobedience and consequence and starts the pattern that we see all through the Old Testament. The next kind of major period in Israelite history is the, what we call the Judges period, which is about 300 years long, right? There was no king, there weren't prophets, there were judges, right? And we're only gonna read one verse that sort of characterizes that Judges time and it's Judges chapter 21. Judges chapter 21. And it sets the tone for all of the judges period, really, which extends down, just so you kind of time frame wise, the judges period extends down to Samuel. Samuel is the last judge. Because after that, the kings start. Remember, he anoints Saul as king. That starts the judges or the king period. But down to Samuel is Judges. It's 300 years long in Israelite history. So Judges chapter 21, verse 25. And in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. <coughs> that kind of characterizes all of the Judges period. Right? Which like Ruth is in the Judges period. Uh, Samson, I mean, all these people are Judges. So that's that period of time. The next major time frame is the period of the kings. We're not going to read about this, but if you read about this, it is just ridiculous how evil some of these kings were. Just ridiculous. I mean, the things that they did. Flat out idolatry. I mean, like sacrificing kids, um, temple prostitutes, the whole deal. And, and yet there were really, really good kings too. But they would be like, really, really good, really, really bad, really, really good, really, really bad. And it was just this, it'll, you'll see it as you read like First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings. It's like, and so and so was king for such and such a year, and he did evil in the sight of the Lord. You know, and all this bad stuff happens. And then the next king is, and he did good in the sight of the Lord. And it's just that pattern. So that extends down to like 400 years. It goes all the way down to, you know, there's Solomon, I'm sorry, there's Saul, David, Solomon. And then after Solomon is that divided kingdom, you know, Israel, northern ten tribes, Judah, southern two tribes. Then it's a divided king. There's kings in each place. But it still extends down until that, on your outline, until 722, when the whole northern ten tribes are carried away. Okay, that's when that stops. And, then, and the southern two hang on for about another hundred years, and then they're carried away. So we see this disobedience, obedience thing all through that time frame. Um, okay, so to show a little more of that pattern, let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is, it, Moses talks about this pattern as we see it through the whole Old Testament. Deuteronomy chapter 28. And we'll read just some isolated verses. We're not going to read a ton of them. I, I encourage you to read this record. This Deuteronomy 28 to 30. Um, Deuteronomy is the last book of the Pentateuch, you know, what we call the Pentateuch, and it was Moses' last kind of speech or teaching or so forth. Deuteronomy means second law, so it's the law again, right? In any case, it's the last thing that Moses says to them before he dies. Deuteronomy 34, he goes up on the mountain, he dies, he never sees the promised land. So Deuteronomy is his kind of last thing. And 28 through 30 is when he says, okay, Here's what's going to happen, guys. If you do this, this is what's going to happen. If you don't, this is what's going to happen. 
So, and these uh, verses are just very, very telling. So, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 15. Um, actually, let's read verses 1, 7, and 10. Now, verse, chapter 28, verse 1. Now it shall come to pass, if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God, to observe carefully all his commandments, which I command you today, that the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth. Verse 7. The Lord will cause your enemies who rise against you to be defeated before your face. They shall come out against you one way and flee before you seven ways. Verse 10. Then all peoples of the earth shall, shall see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they shall be afraid of you. Now, that's what it was supposed to be if they obeyed. Do we see that? No. They get carried away and they're in captivity for 70 years, right? So let's read what act, more about what actually happened. 20, act, uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 15. But it shall come to pass if you do not obey the voice of the Lord your God to observe carefully all the commandments and his statutes, which I command you today, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Verse 25. The Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You shall go out one way against them and flee seven ways before them, and you shall become troublesome to all the kingdoms of the earth. Verse 36. The Lord will bring you and the king whom you set over you to a nation which neither you nor your fathers have known, and there you shall serve other gods, wood and stone. Verses 49-52. The Lord will bring a nation against you from afar, from the end of the earth, as swift as the eagle flies, a nation whose language you will not understand, a nation of fierce countenance, which does not respect the elderly, nor show favor to the young, which means they're going to kill them both, right? Whether you're old and you're decrepit, they're going to kill you. When you're an infant, they're going to kill you too. They have no respect for them. And they shall eat the increase of your livestock and the fruits of your field until you are destroyed. They shall not leave you grain, nor new wine, nor oil, or the increase of your cattle, or the offspring of your flocks, until they have destroyed you. They shall besiege you at all your gates, until your high and fortified walls, in which you trust, come down throughout all your land. And they shall besiege you at all your gates, throughout all your land, which the Lord your God has given you. So, that's what actually happened. What God wanted was that Israel was going to be on top of the world, literally. They were going to be the talk of the earth. Everybody was going to respect Israel if they had obeyed, but that's not what happened. What happened is what we just read. And when he says nation from afar, Assyria was from over in the far east. They came over to Israel, carried all the ten tribes away. And then Babylon, same area, came over, carried the other two tribes away. Okay? Everybody's gone, and they transplant a whole bunch of people into Israel. That's what happens to Israel. Now, before we go on to any other dates, everybody stand up. And greet somebody, take a walk around, do some push-ups, jumping jacks, whatever you like. How are you? <laughs> Okay, so the next date we're going to talk about, which I've mentioned a couple of times, is 722 BC, and it's when the king of Assyria comes and conquers northern Israel, which they do by a siege, by the way. They siege Samaria until they just starve them out. So essentially, that's what happens. 
and then he takes them all away. He carries them all away. Um, we're going to read a little bit about that, but that's what happened in 722. Again, what we're coming down to is when they're released from captivity, 538, and they go back to Israel and start rebuilding the temple. But think about the numbers of years wasted in um, all of the things that Israel suffered, whether you're talking about the specific captivity or whatever it is. We're talking about from when Moses said this in 1450, 1406, uh, 900 years later is when all this stuff is still happening. Do you see how disobedience becomes generational? We're going to talk about that. But disobedience becomes generational. Why that's so important for fathers is we're one of the primary reasons that does or doesn't. Because we're the ones responsible to teach the kids. Nobody else has that responsibility. Nobody else is told, like Ephesians 6, 4 says, um, fathers provoke not your children to wrath, but raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Nobody else is told that except Father. So we are critically important in God's design. I'm not saying, I mean, honestly, I guess I am saying, God relies on us because he has chosen to give us that responsibility. We are critical in whether evil becomes generational or good becomes generational, whether godliness is what's passed on or not. Because in Israel, it wasn't. I mean, we're talking 900 years here, guys, when... It's, it's just, and it's so ridiculous. I mean, so when they go into the promised land and they're wiping out all these people and God says, you know, you kill everything that breathes. If it's a cow and it's breathing, you kill it. If it's a person and it's breathing, you kill it. Nothing lives. But if you look at that carefully, the reason God did that was to eradicate evil. It was judgment. Because 500 years before that, Sodom and Gomorrah got destroyed in the same land for the same reasons. But they're still doing it 500 years later. Okay, they're still doing it. So anyway, let's read Second Kings chapter 17. This is about the Assyrian captivity of the northern ten tribes. Everybody there? You cheater! You cheater! Phone users! You. Second Kings 17. Um, we're just going to read a few verses. Maybe not the whole thing. I don't want to snow you guys with stuff. But um, I think. And I encourage you, if you don't have a reading plan for the Bible whereby you would read it in maybe like a year or two, I really encourage you to do that, to start to get a scope for some of this stuff. Because, for example, you're not going to understand Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you have killed the prophets and stoned those whom I sent you. You're not going to understand that unless you understand these Old Testament records. You're not going to understand that Jesus Christ is talking about 1,500 years of history until he gets there. Because that's what happened. Okay, so in the 12th year of Ahaz, if you know anything about um, Israelite kings, he was not a good guy. <laughs> anyway, Ahaz, king of Judah, Hosea, the son of Elah, became king of Israel in Samaria, and he reigned nine years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord, but not as the kings of Israel who were before him. Shalmaneser, king of Assyria, came up against him, and Hosea became his vassal and paid him tribute money. And the king of Assyria uncovered a conspiracy by Hosea, for he had sent messengers to So, king of Egypt, and brought no tribute to the king of Assyria, as he had done year by year. Therefore the king of Assyria shut him up and bound him in prison. Now the king of Assyria went throughout all the land and went up to Samaria and besieged it for three years. So he lets no food in or out, no water. This is the way he's going to get them. He just blockades everything, right? Three years. So at this point, they're probably, you know, you can read records like this. We're not going to talk too much about this, but they were probably eating their own dung and or eating their own children. And I'm not kidding you. That's exactly what was happening. And we didn't read it, but Moses talks about that in Deuteronomy. This is what's going to happen, guys. You're going to get so bad, you're going to eat your own kids. And this was disobedience. This was not God's will. Okay? Their captivity was not God's will. Remember with Matthew 23, 37, who was in control of the, whether the relationship flourished or not? It was people, people, not God. God wanted this. He wasn't the limiting factor. The people were. Okay, let's see. In the ninth year of Hosea, verse six, the king of Assyria took Samaria and carried Israel away to Assyria and placed them in Hala and by the Habor, the river of Gazan, and in the cities of the Medes. 
For so it was that the children of Israel had sinned against the Lord their God, who had brought them up out of the land of Egypt, from under the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and they had feared other gods, and had walked in the statutes of the nations whom the Lord had cast out from before them, the children of Israel, and the kings of Israel, which they had made. Let's see, now let me just read down so I don't have to read you guys too much. Well, Verse 9, also the children of Israel secretly did against the Lord their God things that were not right, and they built for themselves high places in all their cities, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves sacred pillars and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. There they burned incense on all the high places, like the nations whom the Lord had carried away before them, and they did wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, you shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all his prophets, every seer saying, turn from your evil ways, keep my commandments and my statutes according to all the law which I commanded your fathers, in which I sent you by my servants the prophets. Nevertheless, they would not hear, but stiffened their necks, like the necks of their fathers who did not believe in the Lord their God. You won't read any more there. You can go on if you want to. So the point is, they, they're getting the consequences of their action. Now, you know, we read in Numbers 14, the children of Israel were prepared after seeing the miraculous sustenance in the, in the um, wilderness. They were prepared to find somebody that was stupid enough to take them back to Egypt. Okay? They were, <laughs> there was a, there's a great gospel song. I, ha I haven't heard it in a long time, but it's called One More Night with the Frogs. They were willing to spend one more night with the frogs. They were willing to go back. Now, you know, this is a major, we're looking at a whole nation, disobedience, and how could you do something so stupid? But mind you, we do this all the time, right? Individual, we do this as individuals all the time. If we persist in some sinful, ungodly habit, we're doing the same thing. We're spending one more night with the frogs. That's exactly what we're doing. Right? We're not choosing to obey, we're choosing to disobey. So the next um, major time point is 605 BC, and that's again the captivity that Jeremiah 29 talks about, the 70 years. You know, you're going to be in captivity for 70 years, and then I'll bring you out. That's that captivity. We're going to read a little bit about that, 2 Kings again, chapter 24. And we won't read again too many verses here. I do encourage you to read these records. Um, they are, when you consider what God did for Israel as a nation, what they as a nation saw, and that this is the way they responded, I just, I can't get there. I mean, we'll read a couple of these records. It's just unbelievable that they actually did what they did. Chapter 24, 2 Kings. In his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent against him raiding bands of Chaldeans, bands of Syrians, bands of Moabites, and bands of the people of Ammon. He sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he had spoken by his servants, the prophets. Surely, all, surely at the commandment of the Lord, this came upon Judah to remove them from his sight because of the sins of Manasseh. I'll let you read about those. Uh, and Manasseh, next to the forgiveness that Jesus Christ says to those who crucified him, you know, after they nail him to the cross, it's, it's Luke, uh, it's easy to remember the reference, it's Luke 2, 3, 3, 4, 23, 34, when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The previous verse is where it says, they crucified him, which means they nailed him to the cross. And the next verse is, Father, forgive them, for they know now, first of all, he had the presence of mind to do that. Second of all, he forgave the guys who just nailed him to the cross. Next to that act of forgiveness, God's forgiveness of Manasseh is the second most unbelievable act of forgiveness, in my opinion, biblically. So I encourage you to read about Manasseh. The guy was an idiot. <laughs> an absolute idiot. Anyway, we'll go on. And also because of the innocent blood that he had shed, for he had filled Jerusalem with innocent blood, which the Lord would not pardon, 
Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Judah? So Jehoiakim rested with his father, then Joachim, his son, reigned in his place. And the king of Egypt did not come out of his land anymore, for the king of Babylon had taken all that belonged to the king of Egypt from the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. Joachim was 18 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months. His mother's name was Nehushta, the daughter of Elnathan of Jerusalem. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, came up against Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came against the city as his servants were besieging it. Let's read down. Yeah, verse, uh, we'll just skip to verse 13. And he carried out from there all the treasures of the house of the Lord, treasures of the king's house, cut in pieces all the articles of gold which Solomon, the king of Israel, had made in the temple of the Lord, as the Lord had said. Also he carried into captivity all Jerusalem, all the captains, all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captains, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest people of the land. So he takes everybody and everything. And that's the captivity that um, Jeremiah is talking about. That's, they're in that 70 years in Babylon. Okay? So that's that time frame. So you see, when we were looking at from Moses on, you see this obedience, disobedience, obedience, disobedience, and the consequences of it. And again, you know, I could, it's easy for me to point fingers at Jerusalem or at, at the Jewish nation and say, look at those dummies, look what they did. Again, we do the same thing. Maybe smaller scale, maybe with a lesser consequence than death, but we do the same thing. Okay. Uh, just, I wanted to remind you, the order of the books in the, in the Old Testament, or in the Hebrew Old Testament, these are the first five. And then next in the order of the books are the prophets. You know, and again, if you, what I mean is if you pick up a Hebrew Bible, the order of the books is not as they are in the English Bible. They're in this order. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, those are the same. Then come the prophets. And then come these books, which are called the writings. The, um, Jesus refers to the scriptures this way, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Okay? So the last books of the Old Testament are the ones we are dealing with in Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. They're the, they're, they are the last events before the 400 years that comes between the end of the Old Testament and Messiah. Now, the only reason I want to point that out is I want to read just a chapter, uh, part of a chapter with you in 2 Chronicles. Ezra, by the way, wrote 2 Chronicles. Um, and how are we doing? Everybody good? Okay. All right. 2 Chronicles 36. So 2 Chronicles 36 is the last chapter of the Hebrew Bible. It's the, those are the kind of the last events recorded before the time frame between Old Testament and what we refer to as the New Testament or the coming of Messiah. Okay? Now we're not going to read all of this. We're just going to read verses 8 through 23. Now we're in 2 Chronicles 36. 8 through 23. Would someone be blessed to read? Okay, go ahead. Loudly. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim and his abominations which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah. And Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his stead. Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign. He reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord, and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign, and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God, and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet, speaking from the mountain of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God. But he stiffened his neck, and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord God of their father sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. 
that they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people, until there was no remedy. Therefore he brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion upon young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into the hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king, and of his princes, all these he brought to Babylon. And they burnt the house of the, uh, the house of God, and break down the wall of Jerusalem, and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof. And them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, for they were servants to him and his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill three score and ten years. Then in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, all the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. And that's where the book of Ezra begins, those last two verses. But that whole record is the carrying away by Nebuchadnezzar, but you see what preceded that, why it occurred. The one verse I wanted to specifically call to your attention is verse 16. They mocked the messengers of God, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. Now, that's, that's the last chapter of the Old Testament. A couple of points. Number one, it was after that there was 400 years of no written revelation, no prophets, until coming of Messiah. Number two, God's patience... God has great patience, but there is an end. And Israel had reached that end. They had disobeyed once too often. They had disregarded his spokesman once too often. He was not willing to put up with it anymore. God is very patient, but his patience does have an end. And we need to learn that in our own lives. Again, we have this same cycle, except it's just on a smaller scale. Uh, maybe in our own minds, maybe just thoughts that we think that we shouldn't think, or in maybe actions, but we have the same cycle. We do the same things. Okay? And we see, in looking at Israel as a nation, the consequence of disobedience. That there comes a time when God's patience wears thin enough that he's not going to put up with it anymore. So, let's see. So, the other lesson I just wanted to point out to you is, um, and for this, let's see, let's go to, yeah, let's go to a Joshua 24. We'll go there in a minute. Joshua 24, 15. Who can recite Joshua 24, 15? Anybody? Right. You got, yeah, you got the very first, and there's a middle part that we'll call attention to, but you got the first and the last. But well, there's a middle part that that um, some kind of betrays where Israel was at that time and why Joshua even had to bring it up. But the point is, the history of Israel, as we read a number of times, was unfortunately when they were put in a situation where God says, do this, don't do that, don't do what the people in the land do, I want you to do this, they assimilated. They didn't Romans 12, 1 and 2 talk about this. Don't be conformed to this world, be transformed. They conformed. They assimilated. Um, look at Psalm 106. Psalm 106 is the most startling single record of Israel's assimilation that I know of. Now, I'm not a Bible scholar, I'm just of the ones I'm aware of. Okay? Yeah, verses, uh, let's see, we can read more than that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a 34. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Let's start in verse 34. Psalm 106, verse 34. This is talking about the nation of Israel. 
They did not destroy the peoples. Remember, I, I mentioned to you, God said, wipe them out. Okay? They didn't do that. Right? Concerning whom the Lord had commanded them. But they mingled with the Gentiles and learned their works. They served their idols, which became a snare to them. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to demons and shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Now, it said not only were the people affected, the land itself was affected. Not just the people. <clears throat> Thus they were defiled by their own works, and played the harlot by their own deeds. Isn't it interesting? We talked about Tuesday, we, Margaret and I had the privilege and opportunity to talk about marriage. And I mentioned the fact that one of the greatest um, kind of support scriptures for the sanctity of marriage and the sanctity of a rich sexual life in marriage is that God uses that same image to refer to idolatry. That he says, if you worship an idol, you're playing the whore. That's how special that relationship was supposed to be to God. That marital, human marital relationship and sex within that relationship. The faithfulness, the fidelity within that relationship. That he, that in the greatest relationship to him, that is himself to man, that if that relationship is disrupted, he will use infidelity in marriage as the symbol to describe that. Do you understand? Do you understand where I'm at? So, anyway, that's one of the outstanding records that I know of that represents assimilation. They didn't wipe them out like they were told to. They said, you know what? Listen, teach me about this idol. And they got to the point that they were willing to take their, we studied this in Joshua, but um, in the book of Joshua, but the religions of the land of Canaan would sacrifice kids up to about four years old. Archaeological records support this, up to about four years old. And we're talking like hundreds or thousands of kids. So can you imagine the nation of Israel, right? They had seen, or at least firsthand heard of from their parents, all the miraculous things that God did for them in Egypt and in the Promised Land. And then they take their little two-year-old girl and they put it on the outstretched hands of a metal idol with a fire under it and they sacrifice it. Now, just wrap your mind around that. That's what they did. That's what they did. That's just unbelievable. Just think about that. So that's the power of assimilation. That's what we're not supposed to do. We're supposed to not conform. We're not supposed to be silly putty to the culture, right? We're not supposed to look the same. If you put silly putty, the old, I'm dating myself, I used to be so friendly with kids. Yeah. You put it on a newspaper and you peel it off, it looks exactly like the newspaper, right? That's what we're not supposed to do. We're supposed to transform, not conform, right? Look at uh, Romans chapter, well, look at Joshua 24, 15. We'll look at that briefly. Uh, Joshua 24, 15. So Jeff had, again, the first and the last part of that verse exactly right. The middle part is telling because of what it says about where Israel was. And, and mind you, Joshua 24 is Joshua's last speech to Israel before he died. At the end of the book of Joshua, he dies. He's 110 years old. He's dead. Okay? So this is the last thing he tells them. After he's, these people have all been through 40 years in the wilderness, you know, coming out of Egypt, 10 plagues, 40 years in the wilderness, miraculous sustenance, the promised land, and everything God did there. And then he, we get to Joshua 24. These are the last things he tells them to people who have seen all this stuff. Amazing. But Look at what this verse says about where they were. Verse 15, and if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord. First of all, just think about the fact that he even had to say that. Just think about that, right? And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Now, what options does he say? Either the gods, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood. Remember, evil is generational or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. So you can either use the old idols, 
or you can use the current idols, or you can use the true God. Now, what does that say about where Israel was? That they still entertained those as options. <clears throat> that the true God was not the only option, even after all he had done. He was not the only option. The idols, the old ones that my dad worshipped, or the ones that I'm learning about now, they were options. That's what that verse indicates. We memorized the last part, and it's great. But it says a lot about where Israel was at the time, or even why Joshua had to say this in the first place. And the last thing he told them. Uh, let's look at Romans 12. The first page is going to be close to closing here. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. So uh, we see the obedience, disobedience cycle in the Old Testament. We read about that. We read about the fact that it occurred over 900 years, something like that, from when Moses talks about it in 1400 to um, the captivity that happens in 605, and then they're in captivity for 70 years. So we're talking like eight, 900 years. So we see that disobedience, obedience cycle, and we also see the assimilation. They don't do what God said. They blend. They blend in. And not only do they harmlessly blend in, they actively blend in. They actively become idolaters. They actively practice idolatrous rites. They actively sacrifice their children. They actively bow down to idols who were, which were wood and stone. Okay. It wasn't a passive process. They were into this. So we don't assimilate. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your logical service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So we're not supposed to conform. We're not supposed to be silly putty. We're supposed to transform. The word transform is the Greek word metamorpho, from which we get the English word metamorphosis. We usually word, use that word metamorphosis to describe the change from a caterpillar to a butterfly, right? And our change in our Christian lives might not be quite that dramatic, but the point is we're not supposed to conform, we're supposed to transform. It's an ongoing process. It doesn't stop. We never arrive. You know, um, Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Um, I'm not going to cover these things again, but this, that has to do with, I talked about in Joshua, I talked about the power of words and the idea, it's a new field, scientific field, called epigenetics, which essentially is a scientific field that explores how DNA, you know, the genes that we come with, are modified by the choices we make. And they're even modified to the point that the choices that mom or dad make modify the kid. Now, to give you one example of that, um, okay, Let's, we'll read these two things. I don't want this to get too technical. This is important because, as I mentioned, evil and or good, godliness or ungodliness, is generational. Fathers have a critical role in that. For that matter, husbands do because you affect your wives. Okay? You have, we have a critical role in whether this works or not. The family is critical in God's plan for Christianity to go from one generation to the next. So, addiction is the disorder of the brain and reward system which arises through neuroepigenetic epigenetic mechanisms and occurs over time from chronically high levels of exposure to an addictive stimulus. Transgenerational epigenetic inheritance of addictive phenotypes or behaviors has been noted to occur in preclinical studies. What that means is, if mom and dad are addicted, the kids are addicted too. That's what they're noticing. Here's an example of cross-generational changes in behavior. We're only going to read a little bit. Studies of mice have shown that certain conditional fears can be inherited from either parent. In one example, mice were conditioned to fear a strong scent by accompanying the scent with an electric shock. So the mice we make them smell something really strong. And then when they smell that, we shock them. So we associate the smell with the electric shock, and they become afraid of the smell because of the shock that they get. Okay, So that's what they're doing to the mice. 
right? <laughs> Consequently, the mice learned to fear the scent of acetophonum alone. It was discovered that this fear could be passed down to the mice offspring. Despite the offspring never experiencing the electric shock themselves, the mice still display a fear of the scent because they inherited the fear epigenetically. This epigenetic change lasts up to two generations without reintroducing the shock. So for mom and dad, shock and scent, okay, we're afraid of the scent. Okay, so first generation, so are we, but we never got the shock. Second generation, so are we, but we still never got the shock. So it crosses generations. The choices mom and dad make affect the generation. That's what evil and or good are generational. Now, it doesn't ever mean that you can't make a choice. It doesn't mean that if mom and dad, don't no disrespect to anybody, if mom and dad, doesn't mean if mom and dad were idiots that, and you're their kid that you can't make the right choices. What it means is if mom and dad are idiots, then it makes it more difficult because of some of the choices they made. It may be more difficult for the offspring to make godly choices if ungodly ones were made by mom and dad. It doesn't mean you can't make your own choices. It doesn't mean you're doomed. It means we have a responsibility to make the right choices so that it's easier for our kids to make the right choices. Otherwise, we make it more difficult, not less difficult. Okay? That's the point of this. That's why we don't, we don't conform, we transform. We don't do the obedience-disobedience cycle. We just obey. Just, just do it, okay? <laughs> just do it. We won't, I won't talk about this again, and I won't go into detail about it, but relative to training kids, Deuteronomy 6-7 is so because it relieves us of some responsibility. And here's what I mean. It doesn't say we're supposed to sharpen the kids. It says we're supposed to sharpen the words. The work, God's word does the work. What we are responsible to do is not make godly kids. What we're responsible to do is make sure they hear God's word over and over again. God will do that. He does the work. His word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. We don't have to worry about his part. What we gotta worry about is our part. We gotta, you know, talk about it all the time. We gotta make, we've gotta make those words penetrate so that God's word can work in our kids or in our wife or in ourselves. So God's word does the work. So life lost. Um, God is patient, but there's a limit. Don't conform, transform. And then we are the ones who decide whether we're going to try God's patience. Right? It was the children of Israel and their behavior that tried God's patience. And that ultimately wore it out. Get to get to the point that 2 Chronicles 36, 16, there was no remedy. That was it. He was done. You go into captivity? I don't want to see you anymore. Until... Uh, I guess things changed, or 70 years was up, according to prophecy. But the point is, it was because of their behavior, not because God wanted it that way. And when we look at Matthew 23, 37, you see how much responsibility God was willing to give to man to make the relationship between God and man dependent on man's choices. Just think about that. The relationship between you and God, he's not the deciding factor you are. You're the one that has to want it. He's always going to want it. You're the one that has to want it. 